uh, opening plenary session. I want to call up uh, my friend and Economy League board member, Michael DelAngelo, who's a managing shareholder at Burger Montague. If you don't know what Burger Montague is, it is one of the baddest ass trial law firms in the country. Pardon my French. Um, it's one of the top plaintiff's law firms and right in Center City, a block from our office at 18th and Market. And Michael's actually with the co-chair of their Securities and Investor Protection Group. He's going to talk to you for a minute about the complex litigation that these guys helped to invent. And it's going to be really a neat tie-in to the entire uh, Damon Centola theme for the conference. So, Michael? Hi, uh, good morning. As Jeff said, I'm, I'm Michael Delangelo, and uh, I'm a member of the board of the Economy League, and I'm thrilled to be here today and sharing GPLEX with you. Um, I, as a practicing lawyer, have been given what I consider to be a, a fundamentally unfair directive, which is to be brief. Um, but <laughs> but I, I, will, I will do my best to honor that, uh, uh, not the least of which uh, for two reasons. One is because Jeff told me to. Uh, but also because I'm quite sure that you will find what has preceded me and what is about to follow far more interesting than anything that I have to say. Um, so as Jeff said, I'm, I'm a managing shareholder at Berger & Montague, which is a plaintiffs-oriented, complex commercial litigation firm here, headquartered here in Philadelphia. Uh, we have 70 lawyers, most of which uh, are housed here in our Philadelphia office. Um, and we were founded in Philadelphia. Uh, and we have a few offices around the country, but um, we all consider Philadelphia to be home, and it always has been. Um, but our, our practice is national, and it has grown from one that, that started here and started with cases here in Philadelphia to uh, include cases in really every state throughout the country, uh, as well as internationally. But it is the, the intersection of our commitment and place in Philadelphia for the last 50 years since the firm was founded, the kind of unique nature of our practice and Damon's work that made our sponsorship of this plenary session a natural fit as I reflected on, on Damon's work and came to some epiphanies about how uh, our founding kind of intersects with the ideas uh, that you find in his work. Um, our firm was founded uh, to address a problem in the civil litigation system. Uh, and it really, it came from an idea that David Berger had uh, as former city solicitor under the Dilworth administration and, and one of the drafters of the federal rules that helped write the uh, Rule 23, which is the rule that allows class actions to happen. And that, that fundamental issue was that there are all sorts of laws on the books in the country that preclude uh, certain unlawful or make conduct unlawful and allow redress for them. So violations of the antitrust laws, monopolization, price fixing, uh, securities fraud, uh, unfair treatment of workers, uh, misuse of the environment, human rights violations. Um, but what there was not way back when was a mechanism for widespread redress. So what would happen is the government uh, would, would address um, violations of these laws, but many times people who were impacted by those violations had no way to address uh, the, those harms in a collective way because their particular losses or harm was too small to warrant large-scale federal litigation. And so the innovation of the firm was to step in and fill that void and bring collective actions to bring redress to consumers and businesses and investors. Um, and uh, it's, it's the intersection of of what we do and, and Damon's work that led to this epiphany, which is the way we were able to do that was by building wide bridges, the kind of network that Damon talked about. So as lawyers came and went from our firm, uh, competitors emulated what we were doing. Many of them were based here in Philadelphia. And we built these networks, as Damon talks about, where there was this rapid exchange of ideas and people realized that what we were doing made sense um, and started to emulate that. And as we freely exchange these ideas, um, the practice spread in this way that now spans across the nation. And what it's led to is access for justice for consumers and investors uh, and businesses throughout the country that from our firm alone has returned over $36 billion. Um, so to test some of those ideas uh, that you see in Damon's work and heard about and you know, come to some of your own epiphanies about how all that ties together, 
Uh, we have four leading uh, change agents in complex organizations uh, and that include healthcare, public education, diversity and inclusion, and the business environment uh, that the executive director of the Economy League, Jeff Hornstein, will now lead in a discussion, which I hope you enjoy and I'm sure will be enlightening. Thank you. That was one of those great instances where the sponsor of the panel actually was directly uh, engaged in this, uh, in this kind of work. So that was very cool. And thank you, Michael, for putting that all together for us. So as Michael said, we're about to hear from four change agents in four complex systems. Um, and I'm not going to say anything else. I'm going to let them. So the format here is there. I'm going to introduce each speaker briefly. Um, here she's going to come up and take center stage for five minutes to uh, do a sort of ignite style talk um, uh, to illustrate a problem in their in their uh, in, in their change work, and then we'll sit back down and have a conversation, which will uh, will include you. Um, so you can use reach to tee up your questions, or just keep them in mind and write them down. Um, we hope we'll have uh, more time for Q and A. Uh, after this panel than we did over the last. So with that being said, I'm going to introduce our first speaker, um, a good friend and colleague, Della Clark. She's been president of the Enterprise Center, one of Philadelphia's premier centers for the support of entrepreneurship since 1992. During her tenure at the helm, the Enterprise Center has dispersed over $6 million in loans, helped minority and women-owned businesses secure more than half a billion dollars in contracts leading to the creation of more than 2,000 jobs, a pretty impressive track record. She's also developed a world-class food business incubator called the Dorrance H. Hamilton Center for Culinary Enterprises. So without further ado, Della Clark. I really wish I could take credit for breaking the uh, director of commerce for the city of Philadelphia leg. <laughs> but I can't take credit for that, but I really wish I could. <laughs> so um, I'm really delighted to be here, and it is quite an honor because for 28 years, I've had three words behind my name, the Enterprise Center. And it is an honor and a privilege to have led that organization. And as I think about the remarks that Damien made about complex environments, as I was sitting there and thinking about my own life, my complex environment started actually when I was born. Because I was born with two parents and six other brothers and sisters and one bathroom. <laughs> and so that's where I learned how to negotiate, OK? Um, because I was never someone who could hold it very long. <laughs> Always had to go to the bathroom. So I learned how to negotiate. The second um, time that I recognized my leadership skills was that I was in elementary school and had a teacher by the name of Miss Katie Winters. And uh, she was so boring. And every time we would go for lunch break in the cafeteria, she would go in the teacher's lounge. And so one day, I convinced all of the students that when she came back from lunch, we would all have our heads down on our desks. And when she came back in, she saw all of our heads down, and she said, who did this? And everybody pointed to me. <laughs> so I got in trouble for that. The last time um, I got in trouble in school was when I was in the 12th grade. And this is also when I learned that I had leadership skills because um, I was the first class in Texas who um, was instrumental in integration in our public school. And so I convinced a group of African American kids to walk out of our high school. And, it, and I got kicked out of high school, which many of you may not know this, and I know a lot of people in this room, but it took a judge by the name of William Wayne Justice, who's now deceased, to get us back in high school. And that's when I learned that I had some leadership skills and could lead and motivate and direct others. I didn't, I didn't follow that until after I walked into the Enterprise Center. And that's when I was confronted with another complex environment, which is what I want to talk to you a little bit in my time. Uh, now, I tried to convince Economy League not to put me up here. First of all, I talk too much. <laughs> Secondly, uh, I'm a little edgy right now because I'm in a hurry. I've been at the Enterprise Center will be 28 years in January, and the movement that I am trying to make is on minority entrepreneurship, 
And so I've concluded I want to be a billion dollar coach. And I want my portfolio to represent minority enterprises who comprise a billion dollars. And I'm inspired by two people that have shaped me. Oh man, I only got two minutes left. I'm just getting started. <laughs> Uh, one is Dean Smith of North Carolina. When you think about while he was at North Carolina for 34 years, he shaped and molded talent. And you could hypothetically say that when he left North Carolina, he created a $3 billion portfolio. Bill Campbell, who spent a lot of years in Silicon Valley, which a book is written about him, and they call him a billion dollar coach. And I'm saying, why not in the city of Philadelphia become a billion dollar coach? Now, there's three ingredients that I need to achieve that. Contracts, capacity, and capital. Now, the city of Philadelphia, I think, it has made this environment very complex for minority entrepreneurs, and I'm not calling any of you guys' names out, okay? But um, it's really because we have become a city wanting everybody's list of minority businesses. Instead of counting minority businesses, we need to make them count. And we need to move away from get, send me your list. I hate when people call the enterprise center and say, send me a list of electrical contractors. Send me a list of your food businesses. Tell us what your contract opportunities are, and we will be your trusted advisor and match make them. So the only way I'm going to become, <laughs> thank you. I'm in a hurry, so I don't have a lot of time. Um, the enterprise center is focusing on cap, and I need to announce that we are converting the Enterprise Center into a capital and investment center because for the past year, I've been working on opportunity zones, and what I have found out is that there is a fundamentally difference between a distressed community and a prosperous community. Distressed communities get program dollars. Prosperous communities get investment capital. Okay? We need to move from community development to community wealth, and my time is up. <laughs> Time. No, you can't have oh. time. It's for sale. <laughs> you'll have oh, plenty. Sorry, I mean, you'll have time during the Q and A to get back to to get back to this, Stella. Um, next, I'm going to introduce my good friend and uh, wounded warrior Harold Epps. Um, he's been the direct Harold T. Epps, been the director of commerce for the city of Philadelphia since 2016. He previously, previously served as PRWT's president and CEO from 2007 to 2014. Before that, he was an executive of Quadrant Menasha Corporation and Polaroid. Um, he's on many more boards and commissions than I have time to mention. If we want to give Della any more time, I won't do that. Um, and he's been a great partner for the Economy League with our Page Initiative and many other things. So for, without further ado, Harold T. Epps. So good morning, good morning, good morning. I am uh, Della making progress. Just last week I was on a scooter, yesterday I was on uh, a walker, so I'm now a, a one-man crutch. So, hey, you got to deal with the things that have been dealt with. I got dealt with this, so I am making, happy to be making progress. Didn't know it, Della, but I got put out of junior high school for the same scenario. You and I can talk about that over a drink. <laughs> uh, I, too, integrated the school system in National North Carolina in 1962, so we continue to learn we have a lot more in common. But I'm going to try to honor my five minutes also. Uh, the situation that I want to describe to you is one filled with a little bit of humor. Um, 2009, I got a call from uh, Mayor uh, Michael Nutter, asked me to serve as the chair of the city's tax task force. After I finished laughing, <laughs> I, <laughs> I said, man, I can't even spell Philadelphia. I just moved here, uh, and I don't have time to do that. He says, you're just the guy that I'm looking for. And so, you know, after deliberating, I said, well, the things you don't say no to, you don't say no to your mother-in-law, you don't say no to your preacher, you don't say no to your, no to your mayor. So I accepted the offer. I then find myself, uh, to make a long story short, nine years later, uh, after some debate with uh, the uh, incoming mayor, after I finished laughing again, he says he, he wants me to be his director of commerce. And so I was coming out of my seven years as a CEO of PRWT. I've never done a job longer than seven years. I kind of get bored, uh, and I agreed to do this. And so the long story short, I revisited all the recommendations we made in the tax task force. Many of them, due to the recession, had not been implemented, and said we need to form a regulatory uh, uh, legislative subcommittee. We did that. 
We formed seven subcommittees to try to make some progress on simplifying how Philadelphia does business and make it more business friendly. They have advanced these slides faster than I can talk, but the bottom line is some of the recommendations we had made nine years ago, we are now beginning to make some progress on. It is slow, it is bureaucratic, but I am happy to say that we are making some progress. Some of the things that have been focused on, is, as you would know, painful is slow reduction in, in wage tax that continues. You can't measure it in any one check. You just gotta look at it over a half decade and you can say, yeah, it's, <laughs> it's a little bit lower than it used to be. So going in the right direction, never fast enough, and I know that. Uh, the, one of the things that we, we are most proud of is we are simplifying for small businesses how you deal with and treat your BERT requirements. Now, we just raised the exemption level from $35,000 to $100,000. If you have less than $100,000 of BERT obligation, you don't even have to file, okay? So uh, th that's a step in the right direction. Um, one of the other things is we know the city is way too complex and bureaucratic uh, in, in how we do business. So we have now this continuous improvement task force that we're working on, the same one that we walked away from uh, nine years ago because we were getting nothing done. Some things are happening. Uh, and it's because we now have a pretty reasonable level of collaboration between the public and private partnerships. The speaker that I talked about before is you need networks, <laughs> you need champions, you need agents. I think we have some level of that. We can always have more, but when I, when I look at all of our quantifications, I conclude, anybody who knows me knows that this is my headline statement. We are going in the right direction, but never fast enough. Um, all the things we measure, population, job growth, are all, again, better than they were. For those of you from Philadelphia, let me remind you, this is the first decade in your life that Philadelphia has grown. First decade, unless you're over my age, first decade that Philadelphia has seen growth. The speak, speaker before talks about confidence and change. Over the last half decade, we have gotten the belief that Philadelphia deserves what it's coming to, coming to it after 50 years of believing it doesn't. Think about this. 40 years ago, Philadelphia's marketing campaign was Philadelphia is not as bad as Philadelphia thinks it is. <laughs> I ain't making that up. That's, that, that's what the Philadelphia has decided it would, how it mar market itself. By the way, I tw spent 20 years in Boston. At the same time, Boston, just like New York, had maps. On it was their river, their city and state uh, uh, government <coughs> offices, and the rest of the world was blank. That's, that's the difference. And we're now trying to catch up. So uh, in Q&A, we can talk more about it. But the bottom line is this, we've got more things going for us than against us. We just got to continue to build the network to advance Philadelphia. And I am, I am absolutely convinced that in spite of the growth of the last 10 years, the next 10 years will be even brighter for Philadelphia. Thank you. Thank you, Harold. Next, I want to bring up Paul Tofano. He's the CEO of AmeriHealth Caritas Family of Companies, one of the nation's leading Medicaid uh, managed care organizations. AmeriHealth serves uh, 15 states in D.C., previously served as the uh, executive vice president of the Independence Health Group, and before that, he was general counsel for the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania during the Ridge administration. Paul. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Paul Tofano, and I'm in the inclusion business. As the CEO of a Medicaid managed care organization, I'm in the business of making sure that our nation's most vulnerable citizens get access to the health care system. But I say that I'm in the inclusion business because what my company really does is it helps our members achieve what is meant by the first three words of our Constitution. And I think they're the most important words, so important that they hang pretty large on the outside of the Constitution <coughs> Center two blocks from here. We the people. And it says, we the people, there's no asterisk with a footnote, we the people except people who are poor, except people who are disabled, except minorities. It says simply and powerfully, we the people. Our session this morning is about change. My company has been focused on change on a number of levels for the last five years. Focused on changing the perceptions about the poor, changing the debate about Medicaid and its importance. Changing what have been the typical pathways that the poor and disabled take so that they can achieve the American dream. And changing how my company works to make all of that happen. For over 250 years, our country has stood for equality and opportunity for everyone. 
But despite 54 powerfully impactful years of Medicaid, we're still a country that has millions of people wanting. Wanting prosperity, wanting access to health care, wanting the ability to live independently, and wanting to be embraced and respected as part of our American family. As I speak, you're seeing pictures on the screen of men, women, and children from all walks of life, including the elderly, veterans, and the disabled. They're our neighbors. They're our friends. They're our family members. They are the faces of Medicaid. And for many of them, Medicaid has served as the engine for their American dream. Every day, my colleagues and I at the company try to change the perceptions of the poor and the disabled because many of those perceptions are misinformed and often pejorative. But here are the facts. The poor don't want to be poor. They want a hand up, not a hand out. They simply want a chance. Parents don't choose to have a child with a disability, but they want that child to be able to participate in society as much as possible, and they worry about who will take care of their child when they're gone. By changing the perceptions of the people whom Medicaid helps, we can change the debate in Washington and in legislatures across the country about the future of Medicaid and whether it's expendable. The debate makes the beneficiaries feel as though they too are expendable. And it denies all of us a chance to celebrate Medicaid's profound impact on the lives of millions of people whose ability to stay healthy gives them a chance, a fighting chance, to prosper in society. My company is seeking to change the debate about the value of Medicaid because pushing people to pick a side between either shrinking Medicaid's burden on taxpayers or expanding access to health care, it's a false choice. We can and must do both. We must reframe the debate by asking a different question. What if we didn't need Medicaid as it exists today? What if we could actually eliminate poverty? Is that absurd? Not any more absurd than asking 50 years ago about sending a man to the moon and bringing him safely back to Earth. Eliminating poverty would be one of the greatest achievements in history. The how is the challenge, but the solution is here, possibly in this room. I believe so firmly in our ability to eliminate poverty that I've changed the way our company works. People living in poverty can sometimes be trapped. Many don't have the basic resources the rest of us take for granted, the social determinants of health, such as jobs, education, transportation, good nutrition, support networks, and more, to lift themselves up and on their own. They need help with compassion and without judgment. My company is taking a hands-on, bottoms-up approach to changing our members' lives by looking at the range of factors that determine whether they thrive or flounder. What we call our next generation model of care is going to look beyond clinical care and look at the obstacles that trap them in poverty and keep them from achieving the American dream. Poverty and poor health rise and fall together, and we need to know that. We're changing the debate from one about how the healthcare delivery system has been funded for the last 50 years to one about creating a system where we're changing people's lives for the better. Changing the debate, as I've just described, changing the perceptions of Medicaid and the misinformed perceptions about the poor and the disabled is an exceptional challenge in an environment where the word entitlement has come to describe government assistance programs instead of words like empowerment or compassion. At times it seems that we forget about our wonderful American tradition of fighting for equality and opportunity for all. We forget about taking care of each other, especially in times of hardship, which defines who we are as Americans. And we forget that the best part about achieving the American dream for yourself is helping others achieve, achieve that dream as well. I can't forget and will continue to work to change the conversation so we can address the real needs of our most vulnerable, vulnerable citizens. We have the skills, we only need the willpower to help them find the pathway to prosperity and independence. Again, I'm Paul Tofano, and I'm proud to say that I'm in the inclusion business. Thanks for listening. Thank you, Paul. And last but certainly not least, Dr. William Height has served as a superintendent of the School District of Philadelphia since 2012. He has served in every role in the education system, teacher, principal, central office administrator, and superintendent. He was previously superintendent of Prince George's County Public Schools in Maryland, assistant superintendent in George's Cobb County School District, and administrator in Henrico County, Virginia, Dr. Height. Thank you.
Thank you and good morning. And because I've served in all of those places, I feel like I have the right to also describe school districts and, and <laughs> describe school districts as these monolithic, bureaucratic, top-down organizations, which are no different here in Philadelphia. And when you have those types of organizations, the central administration tends to blame schools for things that they don't implement well, while then schools point back and say, you told us to do that. And, and the product of that is an accountability system that is not diffuse. It is about blame and shame and punishment. And what we're trying to do here in Philadelphia, and what we've tried to do since 2012, is to change that conversation. The crisis when I arrived in 2012 was communicated back to us, and that crisis was around our finances, our school's performance, and it was communicated back to us nationally, locally, back to us as citizens, as parents, as students, as staff members. So what we wanted to do was then change what we use in order to talk about that so that the, the accountability wasn't blame and shame. So we had to create a framework, and we created an accountability framework in the school district that's called the School Progress Report. And that is just an index around four categories that then group schools on a, on a scale of one to 100. One to 100. And then those, those schools then fall into those four domains. In those four domains, then it communicates to us, not the school, not the central office, it communicates to us what we need to do in order to address those schools that are in the lowest category. And so once we did that performance framework, we then had to create a process, and that process is what we call the system of great schools. It was a mechanism to use the information we were getting from that framework in order to make decisions about schools. And then we also constructed a playbook that then captured the things that we did. One of the things that was important is we made decisions about a lot of different schools over the period of time to ensure that children had better seats and that we were expanding the number of higher performing schools and eliminating the lower performing schools. And so a couple of things we, had, we learned over this, over this period. One, we had to iterate and we had some lessons that we learned. We, we had a top-down process as we do in school districts. But we had, to learn, we had to engage a different way and communicate differently. We had to create factors that people understood and criteria that we used in order to make those decisions. And we had to construct a timeline so that the decisions, the announcement of the decisions, didn't outpace the data that we were using to make those decisions. And so here you can see on the slides a couple of examples of the products that we created as a result of this. One was moving from a multi-factored approach to using criteria that was confusing for a lot of people to a specific set of criteria that people, all people understood, communities, schools, educators, stakeholders. Then we had to also focus on the timeline. And we looked at the timeline as we iterated and got feedback back from the communities. <coughs> the timeline indicated we had to look at how do we align the timelines with many of the decisions that we had to make. And once we made those decisions, then how would individual use the resources, the interventions, the strategies in order to improve? So as a result of this work and looking at accountability and how we then diffused accountability so that we were all looking at the same thing to make these decisions, we now see that we have, we're seeing progress in the school district. And I'm happy to say that, like Harold reported, we have seen seven out of 10, this, these are district and charter schools, seven out of 10 schools improve. We have doubled the number of the schools in the, in the two highest tiers and cut in half the number of stu, schools in the lowest tier. And so one of the things that we felt was important was creating a structure that allowed us to talk about this in a consistent manner so that whether you're a district school or a charter school, whether you're at central office or in a classroom, we were all using the same criteria. And with that, we hope to see this process continue. So the byproduct of all of this is that we have schools that are better performing. We have, a, we now, our investment grade credit, uh, the school district of Philadelphia, first time since 1977. Uh, we now have, 
we now have art and instrumental music in all K-8 schools, and now nurses and counselors have returned to schools. But more importantly, more children are graduating, more children are reading on grade level, and it's all because we constructed a way to begin to diffuse accountability in a way that people understood and accepted and could explain. All right, this worked better than I even hoped it would. Thank you all. So what I'm going to do now is just pose a couple questions, start the conversation, and then we will have plenty of time for folks to interact. Again, if you want, if you don't feel like standing up and asking a question, um, you are welcome to use the Reach platform, which you, you got a prompt for a little while ago, to shoot questions. And we have such cool technology that they come straight to me on this iPad. Um, I'm not actually watching, like, TV shows on here or something. All right. So you all, uh, each one of you, uh, foregrounded some structural changes that, um, that really made me think about the relationship to Damon's work. Um, so I guess the first question I, I want to ask each of you, if you could answer it briefly, um, what are the changes you want to make happen in your particular complex system? If you could just sort of distill that down. What are the two or three key things that will make this, the system that you're working in, very complex systems, what are the key things you need to make change happen. And then we'll talk about barriers. But I wanted to sort of identify some of those key, those key ch changes you want to make. Del, do you want to start with you? Yep. The uh, key change that we would like to make is that there's this, uh, we focus too much on what percentage of business we are dedicating to minority businesses. So we need to stop focusing on a slice of the pie and talk about the ingredients of the pie and how we disseminate the recipe. And the biggest ingredient or the most important ingre ingredient is capital. Because you can't build capacity without capital, and you can't do customer acquisition and new contract without capital. So we need to focus on capital. Great, and we'll come back to that in a minute. So for Dell, the key, the key change is access to capital. Paul, what do we say is the key change you need to make, and, and why do you want to make it? So at our company, we're Trans we're literally transforming ourselves from what most would call us a payer or an insurance company uh, to, you know, we're going to manage the social determinants of health for all of our members. And that means that we're going to really go from maybe being an insurance company to a social worker on steroids because our goals are going to go from measuring whether our members get access to the healthcare system and have healthy outcomes to having a successful life outcome. And so we're going to be hiring uh, educational experts, transportation experts, to, to work alongside our doctors and nurses who, you know, today as we manage care and build clinical networks, we're going to build uh, an infrastructure of people and talent as well as a digital infrastructure that's literally going to help us go from measuring people's health outcomes to their life outcomes. And it's going to be a very revolutionary uh, approach for you know, an insurance company to, to make that change. OK, so managing the social determinants of health and building some infrastructure to do that. Great. Dr. Wright. Behaviors, and not of the students. <laughs> <laughs> uh, of the adults. And, and, and behaviors, and, I, and I, I talked about it a minute ago. I mean, one behavior is just making decisions based on data that we all have access to. Um, how we think about young people. What do we do in order to support schools? Um, and how do we develop individuals? And so I would say it, as a, as a, um, a, a more broad-based set of actions, behaviors. OK. And Harold. So working in, ver in uh, a very complex, multifaceted system, I'm the Commerce Director. And so my sliver of the responsibility is to drive growth. And what we need is inclusive growth. And so there are a whole lot of tenants from that, but fundamentally it's about inclusive growth. All right, now let's start. I'm going to start with, um, with Dr. Height, because I think you've, the way you framed your talks leads me to believe you have a lot of thoughts about this. So. Behavior, structures of accountability, those are the key things you're, you're trying to change and are making change. What are the barriers to making those changes in your system? Yeah, I mean, uh, the, um, 
how, how long do I have for this? <laughs> <laughs> Ask so, Maria, I don't yeah, keep yeah, track of time. So, I, I mean, I think quite a few. I mean, one is the, one is the, just kind of the institutional practices of individuals. The bureaucracy that I talked about earlier where individuals confuse uh, authority with real power um, and the, the how individuals think about our young people and what they are capable of achieving uh, and so their resources in, in some cases are barriers the systems and the processes that we need as an organization in order to make decisions around some of the data that I talked about uh, those are all things that in, if they're absent or, or um, ill-conceived con, Ill or, or not implemented in the right way, those all become behaviors. Politics, in some cases, uh, become a barrier. And so it, there are multiple barriers as we, as we think about asking individuals to change behavior. Now, do you mean small p politics or big p politics? Or yes. Both. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. <laughs> and well, so since I have, so the way we structured this, we have two public sector uh, leaders. We have uh, two essentially private sector leaders. Dell is more of a not, not sort of working in the nonprofit space and Paul in the, in, in the corporate space. So I think it would be interesting, you use the word bureaucracy. I know, Harold, that's a, that's a word that comes up once in a while in your, in your lexicon as well. Um, can you talk a little bit about sort of, you know, you talk a lot about we're not, we're doing, we need to keep doing what we're doing, but we're doing it faster. And where does bureaucracy come into that, into play in, in your world? And what are the sorts of barriers that, that you see to getting things done faster? So those of you who know me, I like to have fun while I do my work. So uh, I'm a little levity oriented. So what I say is I am a private businessman masquerading in government clothes. <laughs> I'm not going to do this forever. And so, I talk with Dr. Hyde often. I, I happen to be looking at uh, Dr. Jones. I sit on his board because these are we all are multi-layered, complex systems that sit at the center of helping to determine what the future of the city will be. And it starts. Dr. Hyde used the words attitude and behavior. Do you think you can do it? Do you want to do it? And are you willing to make the sacrifices, the changes, the behavior to do it? I think if we're honest with ourselves. The history of Philadelphia's DNA would be slow on the draw. No matter how you measure it, we would not qualify to be in the first quartile of change, transformation, speed of change, none of that. We are not yet there. Do we want to be, are we going in the right direction? Yes. But well, we got to go a lot faster. And the gentleman who spoke earlier, we got to get a lot more agents of change across the enterprise in the systems and outside the systems who believe we can do this, but we want to do it. One of the jokes in government is, can you be outweighed by the bees? He's got them. The bees are, we be here when you got here, we be here when you gone. <laughs> <laughs> and they can't win. And we know the institutions where they said, we've got to win the game to make the bees want to get on board to change. All right. Um, Del, let me pivot to you for a second. So, you know, we're talking about structural barriers to change. You know, you've had this great line that I've heard, and certainly influenced the way I think that I've heard you say many times, access to capital, coaching, and contracts. And you've, you've really, I, I think, privileged access to capital in your current thinking about, uh, about the system you're trying to change. What do you see as the barriers to, to making that change? What, and, and how are you trying to overcome them? What are the, is there anything we can learn from Damon's work, for example, about the, how to overcome those barriers? Well, I don't look at them necessarily as barriers. I look at it as a lack of information and knowledge. Um, until we tackle small business development in the city of Philadelphia, particularly around minorities, we're going to have a problem with poverty because the future of work is going to come from development of technology and innovation and we need to get minorities in that because minorities hire minorities. And when you look at the city of Philadelphia, we need to increase the number of CEO minorities so they can hire people that look like them and you will see change in the city. I 
told you I'm edgy. <laughs> <laughs> so, so can I be one comment to that? I sat on the Chamber of Commerce Executive Committee and helped drive a DNI report card 10 years ago. And an example of and DNI, DNI is for those diversity who and inclusion report card. It's got five categories, and it says, "What does your board look like? What's your C-suite? What's your management? Your employment in general, your procurement, and then your philanthropic giving." Unfortunately, if you were to measure the state of the responses in 2009 and measure them in 2019, we would not score very well in the amount of change we have made. And when you assess the portfolio and the conditions of our corporate community. You could start by looking around this room. Does this room adequately represent the diversity that, that our demographics call for in the city of Philadelphia? The answer would be not so much. And you could go in almost any room that represents the high echelons of Philadelphia and you're not going to see what the demographics. If we don't change that, we will continue to fall behind because First and second and third graders look very much different than this role. And we've got to embrace that at every level of, of our institutions if we want to be deemed a world-class city. All right. Let me just riff on that for a second. Thank you, Harold. Um, one of the questions that came through in the, in the iPad, which reminded me of, uh, of my own experiences, right? Philadelphia is known as a, as a kind of um, an, a, a city that's averse to change. I used to joke around and say you don't get to become a true Philadelphian unless you've lived here for three generations and hate the place. Um, <laughs> so get it. But as, as, as Damon pointed out, like these thick, deep networks and social ties can go, can go both ways. They can, they can be agents of change and they can also be real agents of inhibition. Um, and, and I would love some thoughts, and I'll, I'll start with Paul since we haven't given you the, the, the chance to sort of weigh in on this question. But I want you to think about in your organizations and in the ways your organizations deal with the external worlds that you need to, to deal with, what are the, do you see these thick ties that we operate in in Philadelphia? We you know, call this the world's largest village, or some of us do. Um, do you see them as inhibitors of change or agents of change? And how do you, how do you sort of flip the switch on this? That's well, a tough question, so I'll yeah, start with well, you, Paul. In our company, we work not just in Philadelphia, but all across the country. And so we see different uh, approaches. But I would say, I mean, Philadelphia is a place that you have to, uh, you have to network to basically to, to drive change. Um, and you need to, but I would say it's no different than life in terms of what we learned from you know, our keynote speaker about trying to, uh, to get people to uh, maybe emulate your idea and to, to give it that legitimacy and credibility, and that takes work. And I think, I don't know if it's so much that Philadelphia is hard to do that in as opposed to our people willing to take the time um, to, to tell their story, to try to get other people to be excited. Um, and I don't know, I think that's just what it takes to affect change, and I don't know if Philadelphia is any different than any other city in that respect. And Dr. Hyde, you have contacts from other places, and, and, and Harold, you do as well. That, are, is Philadelphia, you, is something unusual about Philadelphia in at least our perception of its sort of stickiness? Well, I haven't been here three decades. So <laughs> Me neither. Maybe, um, so I'm not sure I'm, I'm the one to, to, to actually make that judgment. However, I do think that... But compared to PG County or yeah, compared I mean, to... So yeah, so compared to some of the other places, I mean, I mean, yes, there are, there are things and behaviors that individuals participate in here, um, but it's, it's no different than other places. And part of the thing that we always take for granted is that we declare, cha we, we declare that change will happen and think that it's that declaration that then begins to move everything when actually what we're finding is uh, some people just don't know how to operate in that new system and so a large amount of energy and, and structure needs to also be given to preparing individuals to manage the types of things we're asking them to change. And that's a part of the development and, it, and it's not it's not just declaring change or declaring the behaviors or declaring the cultures, but it really is helping individuals understand the rationale behind it 
and managing the change in the organization that needs to happen that then will allow those things to take place. I have a little bit of data and a perspective. So I'm in Southern North Carolina by birth. I spent 20 years in New England. I spent three, 10 years in the Midwest, both Wisconsin and Indiana, and I've been here 12. So a piece of data, within the last 10 years it was true, it may not be true now, but Philadelphia has what, one of the, if not the highest, retention of its birth citizens of any place in the country, okay? So if I were to poll how many of you have born here, died, lived here, and will probably die here, there would be a lot of hands that will go up. That's good and bad. <laughs> and so the, D, the DNA that I have experienced in relation to the birth, if you're from the South, you look north and you say, we've got to be like them. The most arrogant place I've ever lived was Boston, Massachusetts. <laughs> okay? I didn't know how arrogant the place was until I left. They think highly of themselves. The Midwest, they had just operated at a whole different pace. Philadelphia is somewhere in between, but it is rooted, it, compared to the places I've lived, in less desire to change. And in a world that's changing faster, that means we're falling behind. And so I was in, this, it, in, in the Harrisburg advocating for minimum wage one day. One example, we are, remember now, we're still in Pennsylvania. One of my hot buttons is, we have not raised, we talk about poverty. Well, we got 200,000 people in this city who work every day, but still in poverty. One of the reasons, because we, in the Mid-Atlantic, we have the lowest minimum wage of any state we touch, including West Virginia. Last time I checked, we don't aspire to be like West Virginia. <laughs> but that, the next marketing slogan after Philadelphia is not as bad as Philadelphia is thinking is. But that's where we paid our minimum wage. And so we complain and moan about poverty, but yet we allow a, a third almost of our citizens to get up every day and go to work every day and still live in poverty. But if I could add, but I think that's because we don't do a good enough job as a community and as leaders in getting people to understand what it is like to be poor. And I think that that's where you know, the challenges that you're talking about is because a lot of the people who are making the decisions in government have never been poor. Well, that is true. I, you and I can have a whole separate conversation on that one because the body in which you and I both were on the board is one that has not yet chosen to make that a centerpiece of a campaign for what's important. But it comes back to we are reluctant for the pace of change to do what's in the best interest of our citizens. Absolutely, and one thing that occurs to me that there's a, a perception, a perceptual issue, both internal to our organizations, the sort of cultural change that you all have talked about, but also the external perception of what we're trying to do, right? People assume city government is gonna be inefficient and that Philadelphia is what Philadelphia is, that the school district of Philadelphia is broken. I spend a lot of my time when I'm not working actually trying to convince middle class people to send their kids to the school, to public schools, right? Our public schools do not look like the population of the city because so many, frankly, middle class white people have opted out of the schools. I think that's starting to change on a neighborhood by neighborhood by neighborhood basis. And I think some of the friends group stuff that I've been involved in with neighborhood public schools is an exemplifies some of Damon's work that you just have to build these strong ties at the neighborhood level to change perceptions. But I, of course, the healthcare system does not have the greatest outside reputation and perception. Um, and something that Della pointed to, right? There's this perception among um, certain segments of society that minority businesses are not going to be as efficient, not going to be as capable, blah, 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 blah. How do we fight against those perceptions? What are the strategies that we can use? And is there a way to collectively, you know, we've got four real leaders here. We could have had Dr. Generals up here. There's a lot of other folks in this room we could have had up here to have a similar conversation. How do we work together and what mechanisms do we have to work together to change those perceptual problems in our, in, in our you know, our little corner of the world here in greater Philadelphia. I'll start out, um, resources is key. You know, if you think about heads of households that have resources, the conversation at the dinner table is fundamentally different in households where there is a lack of resources. And that then becomes perpetual throughout one's life. And I see it every day with entrepreneurs coming in. 
you know, if you come into the door of the Enterprise Center and you're somewhat educated, have had exposure, your earning ability is far greater than someone who's uneducated and have come through a system of lack of resources. And so the city of Philadelphia has been slow also, Harold, in that regard in addressing the resource gap. It's a tremendous resource gap. Because I have been traveling the United States for the past year on Opportunity Zones, as I mentioned earlier about the di difference between a distressed community and a prosperous community, I have noticed that in a distressed community, we perpetuate poverty through our messaging. Mm -hmm. I hope no one is in here from SEPTA because I don't want to just pick on SEPTA, but I ride SEPTA almost every day because I parked my car at the Enterprise Center. Even coming down today, I rode SEPTA. There is not a single ad on SEPTA from Charles Schwab talking about how you open up an IRA, how you open up a Roth account, how you do asset building. It's all perpetuating poverty. And so as I have gone around the country and seen the difference between messaging and prosperous community, there is not a dollar store in a prosperous community. There is not a save a lot. But every time a new store is opening up in a distressed community, it's a save a lot model. So we need to begin to change how we address yeah. policy through yeah. distressed community because we perpetuate poverty there. We are growing in spite of ourselves, but I, again, um, two things. If you go back 30 years, Using you as one example, the school district was what in the states, 20 years in the state's hands. You go back 30 years, the city was one step from bankruptcy. So again, if you want to talk about progress, we are no longer in that state. But Delos point is, if you compare us to others, we got a long way to go. Remember, 1970 to 2010, 400 thousand Philadelphians chose to leave the city. And what it left basically was it left it to poor, impoverished, mostly black, black and brown skinned folk. What I like to say is over the last 10 years, a lot of suburbanites have decided they want to reclaim the city. And so now we've got a, whole, a lot of factualisms going on. But at the end of the day, we've got a lot of opportunity. And I think rooms like this where honest conversations can be had are one of the foundations for us to make the systemic change that we'll need to make. But what I have challenges with is being patient, but I'm also a realist. We've come a long way in the last 30 years. Thank you. Dr. Wright, Paul, you want to weigh in on this before we open the floor, floor to questions? Yeah, so the, the, um, I was reminded of something, Della, as you were, as you were talking about that, um, about the SEPTA experience. And, and I think, although I'm not, uh, the, I, I'm not the corporation, a business corporation, where we are a public sector organization, but we have found that when we provide access to everyone, that then we see the, the outcomes increase um, it, as it relates to our young people. And I use a couple of examples. Um, the, we, used to, we used to only test for gifted and talented in schools that were in center of city. And then we started testing everybody using a nonverbal cognitive assessment. And what did we find? That the child who scored in the Mensa range was new to the country and lived in North Philadelphia, right? And so when we can create that access and opportunity, and so it, 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 we cannot allow, as the school district of Philadelphia, just for the children in certain communities to have access to instrumental music. Well, and that's a, that's a perfect it. example of like breaking through that prior knowledge that Damon Absolutely. talked about, right? Everyone assumed the gifted kids have to be in the center city right. neighborhoods where, there, where there's affluence. So it's a really good to break out of that. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome so, example. So one recent test done inside the city government in, in, in middle jobs, they were do, doing only a written test and they were not getting the kind of outcomes that they wanted. Somebody asked the question was, is the written test the only way to administer the knowledge? Somebody concluded, no, we can also do a verbal test. The verbal test resulted in a whole set of different outcomes, and the very people who had been le left out and locked out yep. 
found out they knew more than the people who were passing the test, and therefore <clears throat> many, many, many more people of color, women, were now eligible to take these jobs, and it, it's beginning to change the system. So I would challenge all of you who <clears throat> can hear from these two examples to open up the pool of possibilities by asking the question, are we, are we locking people out by the assumptions that we're making? Absolutely. Paul, do you want to address this perception question? I think that, uh, you know, for example, I just left this morning. Our company right now has a forum going on for diverse and small businesses so that they can learn how to prosper and, among other things, do business with our company. And sometimes we've had vendors who, you know, I can't, you know, get a, a contract with your company until I have the kind of size you're looking for, but I'll not, not get there if somebody doesn't give us a chance. And so we've decided to, to work with those companies and to mentor them so that they can ultimately get our business, knowing that this is the only way we're going to start to change the tide. So I, I guess that I would say, you know, to your point about the ads that you're not seeing on SEPTA or companies not hiring small and diverse businesses, that we just have to, it's just bit by bit we have to uh, change those perceptions by taking action. And I think it's, you know, who we hire, who we hire as vendors and, and also helping them because uh, some of our, you know, I would say we've, now we've had companies that, you know, started as, uh, as one individual and now they employ like 20 or 30 people because what we did to help them build their own business and, and give them that mentorship. And I think without taking that type of approach, we're not going to turn the tide and, and change some of these unfair perceptions that are out there. Great. Well, this has been a really good base setting conversation, and I like the way they interact with each other. So give them a little bit of love for that. And now what we're going to do is take questions from you all. We have at least 15, maybe 20 minutes, if I can push Maria a little bit hard. Um, so who's where are the mics? Microphone holders. So why don't we start in the middle with, with my, my friend Marty, and then we'll move. Marty Tusman, Jenkintown Building Services, and uh, proudly moving, moved to Philadelphia recently. Very much struggling with workforce uh, support. And as a Philadelphia public school kid a long time ago, right, Home economics was, excuse me for saying, where girls went to learn how to bake cupcakes. And trade school and trade programs and practical education were virtually non-existent in the public school system. And trade schools weren't very respected and functional at the time. How does the school system, the Philadelphia school um, system, see education K through 12 in terms of practical life skill development, Educate, uh, workforce, um, uh, career development, and how is that being revisioned if it is? Yeah, thanks for the, thanks for the question. Um, and I was one of the individuals in high school who was assigned to the, the trade part of this. And, and so one of the things that we're looking at is what types of, what, what's the profile of a graduate? What are the skills and abilities we want that both that grad, all graduates to have if they're coming from the school district of Philadelphia? And that's being informed in a large part by work we're doing with the Commerce Department now in terms of the skills and abilities that employers or potential employers are saying they need young people to have. So we've expanded opportunities for children in career and technical education courses. As a matter of fact, last year we had over 6,700 industry-based certifications that these young people were earning as a part of that experience. And we've expanded that from just the traditional trade schools or career and technical education schools. Now we have those programs in most of our high schools. And so thinking about that, and, and we are continuing to coordinate that work. But I would also add to your point, it's, it's beyond thinking K-12. It's now really more important to think K-16, K-18, understanding that whatever our young people want to pursue, it's likely going to require some sort of post-secondary experience, whether that's in a trade or in a, in a college or university. And what we're trying to do is set up those opportunities so that every single young person in our district will have that experience. 40% of the jobs that exist in Philadelphia today 
our workforce development unit tells us are likely to be impacted by varying levels of artificial intelligence tomorrow. All right, displacing, replacing, or changing the requirements for that job. So that's one perspective. The other is that Philadelphia has a 37% two and four year degree attainment rate. The Commonwealth is 43%, the national average is 45%. I was in Denver two years ago and theirs is 65% and they were mad because it's not 75%. So we keep a chart in commerce that correlates two and four year degree attainment rate compared to poverty. You would not be surprised that those cities with the lowest two and four year degree attainment rate, Detroit, Philadelphia, Cleveland, Milwaukee, have the highest levels of poverty. And so Dr. Height, Dr. Jettles, and others, we are work, the Office of Workforce Development, the Commerce Department, we clearly understand that we, in spite of all the retention of our Ivy League college graduates, if we do not better educate the birth and the native citizens of Philadelphia, this city will never, ever be world class. You cannot have two-thirds of your population without the credentials to go to work. You, you're not going to work except for the lowest level jobs to Mary Health Caritas, Comcast, anybody else if you don't have some credential beyond high school. And here I'm going to give a plug to an Economy League uh, initiative that we're working on with Shirley Moy at Temple University, the LendFest North Philly Workforce Initiative, which is precisely targeting the adult populations that have been Dis disenfranchised, systematically excluded from, dropped out of the labor uh, of the labor market, and really segmenting that population, figuring out how to get folks back into the workforce, into onto meaningful career paths, and it's an amazing and important and interesting work. Um, and you know, Lenfest and Temple really need to to be commended for for the work they're doing on that. Other questions. Hi, my name is Kay Yu, and I'm an attorney, arbitrator, and mediator at Ahmad Zafri's, a small but fierce minority-owned law firm. And my question has to do with minority and women-owned business certification. In order to compete, um, uh, we have the privilege of incurring added costs, uh, burdens, uh, to go through a really rigorous certification process. Um, to, to be competitive for work with um, in a variety of contexts, in, including with uh, governmental entities. So um, how do we justify that? And more importantly, how do we fix that? So prior to this job, I was CEO of the largest minority-owned company in the region. Here's what the struggle is. We're talking about institutional challenge. Unfortunately, the system, based upon its legacies, does not provide fair and equitable access to opportunity unless there is a way for it to be counted. So these approval systems are in place to try to provide access of opportunity such that there is better balance within the system. Without it, his history says that networks, relationships, unless there's a few who choose to do the right thing, will have an open and competitive system. Historically, that has not been the case, and so the nation, the states, the cities have put this in place as a way to mitigate the historical outcomes. Yes, it is burdensome. I know that. OEO reports to me. We try to ensure that right now the answer is 34, 35 percent of the dollars we spend are going to minority and women-owned companies. And if we didn't have that system, my guess is that number would be substantially lower. It doesn't make it right. It just makes it the reality based upon the isms that exist in our society. Anybody else have a thought about that? Yeah, I, I do. See um, yes, I think that uh, I would love to do away with certification if we had an open environment to do business. But it doesn't work that way because the way it's set up, the private and public sector is more interested in counting how many minority businesses they work with and how many contract versus looking at it from a perspective of it helps them to become competitive. 
And so uh, you, you, the burden is put on you to always prove that you are a minority business because they can't count you unless you are a minority business. So I'd like to see that system be blown up. Absolutely, but, but, but we have enough data that says without, without an accountability system, people gravitate to their comfort zones and for the most part, this system is still predominantly run by white but, men. But, but ag again, and we're, it we're locks out a people that, that are not like them. Yeah, but this is sort of verifying Damon's point, right? About yeah. how our prior knowledge and our the stickiness of our of our networks is kind of inhibiting inhibiting the change that we want to see. Well, in fact, look at the higher ed system uh, uh, at universities. Right? They try to roll back all of the tools that have been in place to try to drive for diversity, and when there's when they got rolled back. The population went back to its more natural state, mm -hmm. locking out women and particularly people of color. Why don't we try and get some from this corner? I see a bunch of hands up. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you for the rich discussion that we had here, and I think Damon pointed on a few things. Um, one of the things I was thinking about while you was having that discussion here is the workforce has changed. I oversee an office of 187 staff, but 70% of that staff are unionized. There's still a lot of foundation principle that um, our unions have not really caught up to up to date. How do we start to begin to have that conversation where we're talking about changing the way how um, their advocacy versus what we want also for an agency to grow? And again, I don't know I appreciate the rich discussion here, but how do we start to include them into the conversation? Because technology, just the way how we have our workforce right now, is completely different in having that dialogue with someone who's been, like you said, bureaucratic, been in the bargain. And I'm all about people's right, but we also need to have that dialogue with them and how we invite others to the table. I think, Dr. Height, you might be able to answer that question in an interesting way. So, and I, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but I know that there have been, obviously it's a heavily unionized uh, world that you live in, but there have been some substantial changes, at least from my, my knowledge, about the relationship between labor and management in the school district over yeah, the, your I mean, tenure. Some, some significant. We've still got a long ways to go on this issue. And, I mean, and to the point there, this is where traditional and institutional systems sometimes present themselves as barriers. There were things that we were able to do around the, uh, uh, having a, a appointed commission that allowed us to, to, to free up some opportunities to work outside of uh, some of the things that were not even in the labor agreements and some are sta in state statute, right? So some are in state statute that says that if in fact you have a reduction in force and you call those individuals back, they must come back in seniority order. Well, that presents a problem if, in fact, then the most senior don't have the skills needed to go to the schools that they would be called back to first. And so it was, a, it was an opportunity to use some of, the, some of the scenarios like that to really change as a part of, of what we tried to negotiate. The, the other thing is really problem solving around the issue. Um, and not the, the thing in the contract. And it, we were problem solving around the issue we were trying to solve. And if that issue we were trying to solve was one that was something that we're coming up on, and we call it leveling in, in the district, um, that happens after the school year starts, and it's really a way to move resources to where children are, and if, in fact, you are expecting 30 children to show up in the fifth grade class, but only 10 show up, but then we have another school where 50 have shown up, and you need that teacher at the other school, but the seniority factors then don't move that teacher, it moves the kindergarten teacher, then that teacher has to move down to kindergarten, then how do we solve that issue? And that, that Thinking about that issue is different than thinking about that, that line in the negotiated agreement that says we shall use seniority as the basis for making those decisions. And so really making it issue-based um, versus, the, versus the, the, line the by line, bargaining. line in the contract that we are trying to address. And that's, and, and, but the thing is you have to continue to communicate. And it, it, it has to be communication that is ongoing and regular and issue-driven. I think we have time for one more question from the floor. 
Good morning. Is it on? Hello, check yeah. one, two, one. You're on. Okay, great. Uh, good morning. Thank good morning. you to all the panelists. Um, I do have a question, and it's how can we elevate black wealth mindsets and behaviors from counties like PG, uh, Prince George's County in Maryland, and really adopt those uh, mindsets and behaviors here in Philadelphia? Um, because a lot of times we focus on um, you know, the poverty, of course. It's a majority city of people of color. But there are counties and states across the country that I believe we can look to to help us change our policies and our practices that have um, you know, black wealth that has been around for centuries. And so how do we really incorporate that into what we're doing? Um, the next thing I'll say is, is that there's a teacher within the school district, Kwamir Trice, who is an elementary school teacher in North Philly, and he's actually introducing an entrepreneurship curriculum to those North Philadelphia students. So my question is, how do we engage young people in our conversations around systems? Because quite frankly, they don't want to participate in this system. And so how can we involve them within our process to build the future because they already know that these jobs are going to be eliminated by 40 percent which is why they're driven towards artificial intelligence and addressing things you know such as automation because they know that the system will not work for them they're forward thinking and so i know it's a long-winded way of saying <laughs> how do we incorporate black wealth mindsets, but also how do we engage our youth and our young people in addressing these complex systems? Because they will be the users and consumers of the systems we're building today. Who wants to take that one? I'll, I'll, I'm not sure we have enough time to answer the question, yeah, yeah. but. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll say the thing, because it was interesting, the reference to Prince George's County. I mean, and uh, the, like the perception of black wealth there, and as superintendent of the, the school district in Prince George's County, we were also chastised from being second to the last in terms of our performance, although the performance was like in the 70th percentile because all the other districts did well, we were also chastised by the community too. It's not, it, and, and so it, it, was, it, it was some of the same problems, but it wasn't around race, it was around class, um, where individuals were trying to get away from individuals of different classes simply because they had made it to a different place. The only other thing I'll say on the entrepreneurship, and I know uh, Kwamir uh, well, I, I hired him um, out of Howard um, and paid off his student loan. Um, and, and so, but one of the things I think is really important is that we have to have these opportunities for young people in as many places as possible. Because our, we, have to, we have to instill in our youth here in the city of Philadelphia, not just black youth, all youth, how to be uh, hyper producers versus hyper consumers mm -hmm. and and how do we provide the opportunities for them to experience those types of things in schools and in neighborhoods and in communities because those things are the things that are relevant to them right now um, and we have started to create those opportunities in new types of schools that we're constructing and new types of programs that we're doing in collaboration with the community college with Temple, with Penn, and others as well. And so uh, we're gonna continue to expand on those things as we, as we talk about the knowledge and skills that we want our young people to have, but it is entrepreneurship, it's financial literacy, it's those types of things that we have to create those experience young enough so that our young people are becoming more and more comfortable with it. But I'll, I'll go back to the point I made earlier. Our children are ready to do that. We have to, we have to help the adults <laughs> um, to actually give them the space and the trust in order to, to do those things. And never, lose sight, never lose sight of the root cause. You talk about poverty. We, you cannot run from the fact that we got 25.5% poverty, plus never lose sight of the fact that Prince George's County probably is one of the highest income per capita and higher educated for black people counties in the country. We sit at the very other end of that and there's a whole lot of conditions that we must transform financial literacy you got to be able to read and write all of those things before you get to get to wealth so I'll be happy to talk more about it since we 
Well, thank you. That was a great way to end this, wrap this up. Unfortunately, I'm being given the hook. Thank our panelists. Through our, through our social platforms, there'll be plenty of other opportunities to engage, and um, I'm sure they would be interested in, in, in talking during the break. We need to take a short break now, 10 minutes. Lunch is going to be served back in this room at 12 sharp, but we need to sort of move out of our table so the staff can clear things up and then come back in here for lunch. Thank you very much.